Okay, double displacement reactions. I think you'll find this pattern familiar from grade 10. We begin with two reactants, two compounds, and the products you'll see are the result of switching the cations and anions around in the reactants. So you'll notice that A and C are the cations here, and originally A is partnered with B and C is partnered with D. And in the products, A is now paired up with D, and C is paired up with B. So A is now with D, right? And C is with B. It's important to notice that we write C first and then B because the cation is always written first in an ionic compound. Okay, so you have three options for producing products in a double displacement reaction. First of all, a precipitate may be formed. So there will be solubility guidelines that we'll look at how to interpret those in a minute. And those solubility guidelines will inform you if a precipitate is formed. So we're looking for a product of low solubility. Second possibility is that a gas is formed. Very specifically, look for H2S gas or look for the formation of ammonium hydroxide, carbonic acid, or sulfurous acid. So in our double displacement lesson, we indicated the decomposition of these substances to produce a gas and water. So pause the video now, see if you can recall those, and fill in the products of these decomposition reactions. Okay, so hopefully you recalled the production of ammonia, CO2, and SO2 along with water. So I'll show you how double displacement then triggers a product that decomposes to produce one of these gases. And then part C, a third option for a double displacement reaction occurring is if a, a new molecular compound is formed. And we'll commonly see that with neutralization reactions where water is formed. Just a refresher on that pattern that an acid and base combine to form a salt and water. Okay, so for part A there, it became important to be able to predict the solubility of ionic compounds in water. So this table is part of your test reference sheet. It's on the back side. It is not the activity series of metals. This is called, these are called solubility guidelines. So it's really important that you understand this table. So let's take a look at the structure. There are three columns up here, solubility, the ion, and then there are some exceptions. So I'd like to point out under the solubility column, there really are two choices. You either have compounds that are very soluble or compounds that are slightly soluble. So here's where your precipitates exist. If it's slightly soluble, we use the subscript S for solid. If they're very soluble, then that means that the ionic compound dissolves in water. So typically, what's showing up in the column of the ion here matches the solubility rule. There are a few exceptions, and that's what's listed in the third column. So we're going to now use this solubility, these solubility guidelines to assign either S or AQ to these 12 questions below. So I've listed the ionic compound, and now we're going to go through and use the table to figure it out. So for part A, silver nitrate, AgNO3. We look for typically the negative ion, um, and here we see the nitrate right away. So the nitrate ion is in the top half of the table where we see aqueous. So that means that compounds, including a nitrate ion, are usually soluble. Are there any exceptions? Oh, no, there are not. Therefore, we can put AQ beside silver nitrate. So what we've learned is that silver nitrate is very soluble in water. Now let's try part B, silver chloride. Now we're looking for the chloride ion. So as we scan down here, hopefully this name, halide, makes you think of halogens or the negative ions formed from the halogens. So we're thinking fluoride, chloride, bromide, iodide. So that means we're in the right, we're at the right row here for halides. This includes chloride. So typically the chloride compounds do dissolve in water. They're aqueous. Now we've got it paired in part B with silver.
So as we scan across here, oops, we realize the silver ion is here. So actually silver chloride is going to be an exception to this rule. So if it's an exception, right, if it's an exception up here, that means it precipitates forming. And so we can put silver chloride with a solid. If you think you're getting the hang of this, then try them all and check in with me. But I'm going to do a few more to help out if you're still finding it tricky. Potassium sulfate. Okay, so now we're looking down the ion column, right, for the sulfates. Usually you're looking for the negative ion. Now I see the sulfate here, and I see that sulfates then in the top half of the table are typically aqueous. So I look over to the right to see if potassium is an exception, and I don't see potassium there. In fact, the only place I do see potassium is right here, and they're saying that any compound with sodium or potassium ions, right, will always be aqueous. There are no exceptions. So that's a really useful trick to notice. We saw in the first example that nitrates are always soluble, so as soon as you see a compound that has nitrate in it, you can write aqueous. And now we're seeing that as soon as you see a compound that has potassium or sodium up front, that it will always be aqueous. And it's consistent with the sulfate rule that we just looked at. <clears throat> okay, calcium sulfate. So again, we're looking down here, we see the sulfate, typically aqueous, and then we check for the exceptions and notice that calcium is there. That means calcium with sulfate is an exception to this rule. Therefore, not aqueous, but a solid precipitate. Okay, again, if you're getting the hang of it, keep going. Pause the video and then you can check in later. Okay, magnesium bromide. Hopefully you're thinking bromide is a halogen again, so there's a halide ion. So the halides are typically aqueous. Now what about when magnesium is the cation? Oh, it's not an exception, therefore that means it follows the rule. So magnesium bromide will be aqueous. Part F, ammonium hydroxide. So we look down here and we find the ammonium. Oh, ammonium, without exception, is always aqueous. And so that's a quick clue for us to jot AQ here. Hey, part G, sodium acetate. So now I'm looking down here and I see the acetate. I also see sodium. Acetate is showing me always aqueous except with silver. So right now it's with sodium, so that supports aqueous. And sodium compounds are always aqueous, no exceptions. So pause the video if you haven't already and try the rest of the questions. I'm going to fill them in so that it's faster when you're checking your work and I'll talk, speak to them very quickly. Okay, copper to sulfate. Checking out the sulfate here, we realize they're usually aqueous except with the copper two ion. So as I scan here, I realize it's not an exception and therefore aqueous. Question I, lead to sulfide. So I look up the sulfide here, find it in the precipitate section. Okay, now that means it's typically, typically sulfides are solids, except with group one and two ions and ammonium. Okay, so lead is not that, so lead to sulfide will be a precipitate. Question J, lithium carbonate. I find the carbonate right here. It's in the bottom half of the table. Carbonates usually form precipitates, and so I check and see if there's an exception, except with group 1 ions and ammonium. Oh, lithium is a group 1 ion, therefore it's going to be the exception to this rule. So the exception to the rule, since the rule is solid, the exception down here is aqueous. Okay, zinc carbonate. So now I find the carbonate here, realize they're usually precipitates. Is zinc an exception? No, therefore we follow the rule zinc carbonate solid. And the last one here, calcium hydroxide. I check out the hydroxide and realize they're usually precipitates, except, oh, it includes calcium, that's an exception, therefore calcium hydroxide is aqueous. Okay, so now we're going to be using that solu those solubility guidelines in order to 
decide if a precipitate is formed. So in figuring out the products of a double displacement reaction, I suggest you undo the reactants, the compounds into the ions that they were formed from. So the silver ion and the nitrate ion, made up silver nitrate. The sodium ion and the chloride ion, made up silver nitrate. So now we're going to switch partners. So now the silver ion is going to be with the chloride ion and the sodium ion is going to be with the nitrate ion. So the idea here is that everything I wrote in red is rough work. So, but I do recommend you show it. It's going to help initially and then later when we do total ionic and net ionic equations, I think you'll find them easier because you're in the habit of doing that. So we cross charges down and over here we see AgCl, cross charges down and over here we have NaNO3. Now we can check the solubility guidelines. So you'll need to go back and look at the solubility guidelines on your test reference sheet on the back side of the periodic table. Hopefully you see that silver chloride is a solid and anytime you see sodium in a compound or nitrate you can anticipate aqueous. But check the rules if you doubt me there. Okay, last step is to balance. As we check the silver ion, we see that there's you know, one here and one over here. There's one sodium and one sodium. There's one chloride and one chloride. And there's one package of nitrate and one package of nitrate. And so everything's balanced and that's it, all we need to do there. Okay, part B. Again, we are undoing these compounds to think of the ions that they came from. So the sodium ion and the sulfate ion, the magnesium ion and the chloride ion. Where am I getting these charges from? Well, I'm looking at the periodic table and finding out what group they're in. These formulas have been formed from those ions and if you check crossing down, you'll see that that's the case. So now the sodium ion is going to pair up with the chloride ion and the magnesium ion is going to pair up with the sulfate ion. So again, that's rough work. Now we're crossing down charges. So we form NaCl here. And when we cross these twos down, those twos will end up reducing. So we'll finish with MgSO4. And now we can check the solubility guidelines. So any compound that has sodium in the front is definitely going to be aqueous. And when you check out, check out magnesium sulfate, you'll notice that the sulfate compounds are usually aqueous. And in fact, magnesium is not an exception. So this is actually aqueous. So look what happened here. In example A, <clears throat> we formed a precipitate of silver chloride as well as an aqueous solution. So a reaction happens here because a precipitate is formed. Look what happened in example B. We had an aqueous product here and an aqueous product here. And so the idea is that no precipitate is being formed. So we have to ask ourselves, is a gas being formed? Well, that's the only way that a gas could be formed, I'll just back right up here, is if one of ammonium hydroxide, carbonic acid, or sulfurous acid are the products of the double displacement. Because if one of these is produced, even though it's aqueous, it will rapidly decompose and produce a gas plus water. So moving back up here, <clears throat> we see that NaCl and MgSO4 do not decompose to produce gases. So in fact, after doing all that work, I'm going to cross it out and say no reaction here. Okay, let's try the next one. So why don't you write the products yourself? So figure out the ions that each reactant is formed from, switch partners, cross charges down, and write your products. Check in with the video when you're done. Okay, so hopefully you saw that we produce ammonium hydroxide and sodium chloride. Now you check your solubility guidelines. You'll find that both of these are aqueous. So we're thinking no precipitate is formed. Is a gas produced? Well, ammonium hydroxide, in fact, does decompose into ammonia gas and water. <clears throat> 
And so there are actually three products here due to the rapid decomposition of the ammonium hydroxide. So the final answer actually involves both reactants and all three products. So it's important to balance this equation also. And just a little trick for you, I recommend balancing it at the double displacement stage. And then any coefficient that ends up here, you would just transfer down into this spot and this spot. So it turns out that everything's one to one here. And so I'm just going to leave the coefficients blank and understood to be ones. Okay, so how about example D? Undo the compounds of the reactants, switch partners, write your products, check the solubility guidelines, and see if a reaction occurs. Okay, so hopefully you came up with NaCl and H2S. You'll notice on the solubility guidelines that sodium chloride is aqueous. H2S, now be careful here, that hopefully triggers back to your lesson if you just look up ahead in your notes where you wrote for part B how a gas can be produced. H2S is actually a gas. So this reaction actually produces a gas that smells like rotten eggs. So hydrogen sulfide is not a pleasant odor and it's easily detectable when it's being produced. Okay, last example here for part E. So go ahead, undo the compounds to see what ions were used to form the reactants, switch partners, cross down to charges to write your formulas of the products, check solubility guidelines, and decide whether a reaction is occurring. Okay, so you'll notice we have the H positive ion and the sulfate ion from H2SO4, the K positive and hydroxide ion from KOH. So as we switch partners, we end up with H positive and OH negative, which when I cross charges down is HOH, and K2SO4 is our second product. Now just a point here, HOH, we could write that as H2O. So in fact, liquid, uh, liquid water is being produced, and any compound with potassium up front is definitely aqueous, so there's our potassium sulfate. So in fact, this was a neutralization reaction. And we'll just make a point of that. So in the general form of a neutralization reaction, we set an acid plus base. So here's your acid with the H up front. Here's your base with the hydroxide. That produces a salt and water. The idea of the salt really is just an ionic compound. So potassium sulfate here is our salt and there's the water. Okay, that's it for double displacement. I think the only thing I might say, and I did it in this last example, was just to be careful that it, when you're working with polyatomic ions, like we are over here, to make sure you put brackets so that when you are crossing the charges down, you know, you, you may need to have the brackets in the end. In this case, we didn't, but just something to be aware of. That's it.